start. Perfect. Can everyone hear me good? Okay, if you guys can't stop hearing me at a certain point, just let me know. I move around a lot. I apologize ahead of time. I'm Samuel. I'm going to talk about embracing automation. Um, it's Adobe branded, so you'll see Adobe branding. But I'll talk about a little, some stories from there um, and about what we've done. It's a lot about things that went from cradle to where we're in now of starting a whole automation process around compliance. Now, I want to know a little bit more demographics of who's all here. So do we have, like, how many people here are, like, college students, high school students, that folks? A few over here, sweet, a few there, perfect. So a little more entry level there. And then do we have a lot of security engineers and security folks who are in the depth of things? I'm assuming a bigger portion. Do we have any compliance folks? I got a few compliance folks here. Okay, so these are the folks that everyone else doesn't like so much. We understand. Any auditors that go with that compliance side, or are they all the same? Okay. Any other demographics that they want? People want to identify themselves as good. Okay, that puts a little perspective on how I'll play this then. Okay, so one of the things I want to talk about is the problem that we have with compliance in general. One, it's super resource intensive. So for a lot of the folks who may not be familiar, I hope some of them are, but when you're looking with audit things, typically you're providing tons of evidence to things, you're reviewing paperwork, re reviewing work that other people are doing, and it's very manual, mundane, and a pain in the butt, and no one likes doing it, which is the audit mindset. Um, you have lack of agility. Compliance hasn't really evolved other than until a few re recent years when a lot of startups start popping up to try to solve this problem as well. Um, but typically, compliance doesn't evolve that much. It's lots of screenshots, it's a lot of evidence, and a lot of paperwork, a lot of meetings. Oh my gosh, so many meetings. Um, then audit challenges. So here's one of the things that you have is sometimes the evidence you get is wrong, and you have to go through this whole process and doing it all over again just because the things you get aren't what you asked for. Right? Um, or you have problems where you're saying, hey, I need something, like I need a password you rotate. And you're like, cool, I can do a screenshot of a password I rotate. And they're like, oh, no, no, from nine months ago. And you're like, how am I going to have a screenshot of a password I rotated nine months ago? They're like, oh, but we need evidence of you doing it back in June. And you're like, uh, there's no way I can provide you that. Like, that's not happening. So, so these are the challenges that you have. And then so they have high risk of error. Right? Like a lot of times, what you're asking for is not what people understand. So a trash can, a recycle bin, people putting a banana peel in a recycle bin, some people think it's a trash can, regardless, right? But when you're talking about evidence, what an auditor wants sometimes isn't what the engineer's expecting, the product team's expecting you to provide. So you have lots of error there. So one of the pain points is having screenshots, and you have to have these semantics on exactly what's in that screenshot to prove that it was what it is. So that's the problem. And before I go into farther, I want to define automation. We have the use of largely automatic equipment, a system of manufacturing other product processes. That's Oxford's definition. Don't really make sense to me. But so this is my definition. The use of automated processes or systems to perform a task. You can f argue with that one as much as you want. I agree with you regardless. And then this is my boss's definition. It's a dashboard. And Yes, the dashboard, it is automation in a sense, but I'm not going to waste my time just building a dashboard. So um, let's talk about automation then um, and how, we, how I've been defining it and how we can also find more definitions of it. So there's a lot of opportunities with automation. And so when you're doing it, you create a plan. You identify, hey, this is what I want. This is my purpose. I'm going to try to do this, right? And here's my scope. Now, I'm going to identify a few things. If you don't have a scope, this is an endless forever hole. And leadership is going to expect you to have an end date, but you'll never have an end date if you don't have that scope defined because they just keep on adding more. And when you start automating things, you're going to be like, oh, man, this other thing's going to be helpful, and this other thing's going to be helpful, and someone else is going to be like, hey, would you mind doing this at the same time? While you're doing that, like, it'll be really helpful to everybody. And you're just like, oh, yeah, let me help you there. It's black hole. Define that scope. Otherwise, you won't get anywhere. So have a purpose, what you want to do, scope it. Then talk about types of automation you have. And on the next slide, 
We're going to talk a little bit more about types, but high level, it's how you're going to get that automation in place. Now, potential impact. This is how you're going to get your budget, because otherwise you're not going to get any time or budget to do anything. Right? So you need to identify, hey, this is what I'm actually trying to get done, and how this is going to add value to the organization, either yourself or the company. It's a pain in the butt part, but that's the one that the business really wants. Then you have to identify how you're going to prioritize that, because I'm sure everyone here is super busy with their own job, and now you have to automate something, but then that's going to help your job, but you don't have time to do it. Chicken and egg scenario, no fun, but it's part of the deal. Then you have to identify how am I going to do it. Similar to the type of tool you're going to use, but a little bit more of what's the plan, what's the roadmap, what's the design. So let's talk about that part, the tools. You have different scenarios. Uh, this is just high-level examples of scenarios. But one, if you're an auditor and you work with auditors, you know they love Excel. Excel's their baby. Everything's in Excel. And if it's not, they say, hey, export that in Excel for me so I can do it in Excel. Uh, and you're like, no, I have it in a nice database, nice interface. And they're like, no, no, an Excel would be great. And it's like, OK. So one is definitely Excel's and VBA. Like they, and some of, those, uh, some of those auditors know VBA really well, and they can do those things. And they've done some great automations just in that scenario. But Excel, that's one. Another one is write your own scripts, um, especially if you're security. A lot of folks in security know how to do scripting, at least. Right? It may not be a software developer where they're building things like Photoshop or some other Mayus product, but they can do some amazing scripts that can do a lot of work. So that's another scenario. Another one might be build and buying a third-party tool. Right? Um, we have here a lot of vendors, so like Paramify, Drata, Matt Hillary presented a little earlier for that. Some third-party tools are amazing for what they do. Right? And for your business, it might be the bee's knees. It might be the best thing you can have for exactly what you need. So identifying that purpose and that plan might be saying, hey, let's pop on this third-party tool. We can get that audit done, all those things done, all those projects quickly. Right? In contrast, you might say, hey, our environment might not fit with those needs. We need to build a whole shebang. So as I talk through the little examples, Adobe, we've done all the above. And it's been a pain. But it's been awesome. So let's talk about the next thing, implementation strategies. Um, these are my three I talk about, parallel, phased, and switch bang. Um, parallel, as you expect it, you're doing your old way and your new way, and it takes lots of time, but you can validate the crap out of stuff. You can say, okay, did I planned it to do exactly what it originally did? And for a lot of people, that's nice to be able to have that validation. But it's very time consuming, energy consuming. Then you have a phase where you're slowly moving things out. Big projects, this is very nice because you can be like, okay, we're gonna do this bigger initiative, work towards it, see the impact, get funding, do the next big initiative. Um, it's really nice on a more budgeting of time and finance on that side. Then switch to bank. This is the scary one. Um, anyone who's done operations, they understand like switching from one environment to the next environment in one night is always stressful. You're just hoping it works. So that said, ripping the Band-Aid off sometime in compliance is really nice. Where you just say, OK, stop doing that terrible process starting tomorrow, this beautiful environment. Um, it's the most expensive because typically you're buying a tool to be able to do that. But just noting, think, keep those in mind. So monitoring and continuous improvement is the other part. And so during this process, a lot of times leadership is going to want to be able to see what value is actually coming from all your efforts or money or investments. And you won't be able to prove any of that if you aren't measuring things. So one is improvements. Monitor the improvements you're doing, right? No, okay, is it running? Is it working? And especially once you build automations and you start doing it a lot, some of your older ones you forget about, and then they break, and no one knows until the quarter end, and then they have to run something, and you're like, oh, fix that real quick. That's not never a fun thing. So put it in. When you write things, develop things, monitor it. Make sure it's working. Measure impact. You made a, pr a proposal to leadership at one point that says, hey, this is the impact we're going to have. Now, you need to prove that you've made that impact or you've exceeded that impact. And if you didn't, what went wrong? What impact are you going to provide if you still have it? And what can you change? And that's that reevaluate, right? Identify what you did good, what you didn't do good, 
and make it better. So that's the simple like explanation of logistics. Now I want to talk about how a little bit of how I've gone about doing these things in my own thought process and take it, leave it. That's pretty much how this talk works. But so first thing on here is how to build simple control automations. Now, there are simple things earlier, and we'll talk about those when I talk about more examples, but simple automation, this is how I go about doing it. One is data. You need data. If you don't have data, you can't really automate crap. So a lot of times when you work with teams and they say, hey, I'd like you to automate this tool, this process, you're like, sweet, where do you get that data? And they're like, well, someone just emails it to us. And you're like, oh, that's good. Where do they get that data? And you're like, they're like, I don't know. So you have to go find that person, find that person. And you have to go through this process to get the data. Because once you get the data, you can actually do something with it. But you can't really automate something if you don't have any data to automate. Right? I think it's pretty self-explanatory until somebody asks questions, and then it's a little more complex. Now, another part of automation is improving the process. You can automate something to do exactly what it was done before. But you're not really adding a ton of value if you're doing exactly the same thing. A lot of times, especially with the compliance, the process is archaic, and you don't want to automate something that's archaic. For example, providing screenshots. You don't want to automate the process of taking a screenshot. Like, that doesn't add any value. Instead, get rid of the screenshot and automate the process so you don't have screenshots, right? So improve the process. Now, self-service. If you're having a boat that's sinking because there's a hole in it, you can bail water. In fact, you should bail water, but then you should probably plug the hole, too, right? If you automate a process that has manual efforts around it, get rid of new things. Automate the process. Another part of this is making it self-service and the fact that have them come to you. If you build something phenomenal and you push it out to other people, a lot of times they're going to hate change. They're going to be like, no, I don't want that. I'm fine. The way we're doing it is great. But then if you say, hey, look at all these things, and this is all the time, effort, and everything you save, and then you look like an amazing person. And they're like, oh, I want that. They, that team did. And you're like, well, here. Here's a wiki. Here's the process. Onboard to this process. You can have all the benefits they have. Right? And now they want what you have. So it's a little different process. But if you have them come to you for security, they take ownership. You're not owning their process. They own their process. You are facilitating them to be more compliant, more secure, wherever it is. But it's they own their environments, their systems, their business. So that's one thing. Next is actually automating the process. Um, process automation is what my bread and butter is. So we look at what they're doing, say, hey, let's get rid of all the mundane, painful things and make it better. And then you have machine learning and AI. And so this whole conversation, you guys are probably like, hey, there was no AI discussed so far, and that's why I came down to sit here for. It's because that's the cool thing. I understand. It is the cool thing. And all my developers are like, AI. And I'm like, cool, budget. <laughs> no one got it. Right? So, but there are some sweet things you can do with AI. And so I'll throw through my examples um, when we talk to the example section. But using the right tool at the right time is key. Right? right now, the key term is Gen AI and all those things. So leadership is all willing to love the idea of you doing that without any budget. But using that AI to perform tasks or action tasks can be very beneficial. And we'll talk some of that. And then AC Arrow. This is a continuous process. You'll never get away from it once you start. So for my side, architecturally, I do these five layers, I call it. Um, in the end, going back to how we implement, as I said, Adobe, we've done all the different kinds of implementations. This is one example where we built a platform. In a platform, you have a UI. Someone needs to interact with it. They have a way to do it. You have a rules engine, and that actually does your checks. Then you have your integration. That's it connects to the world, pulls all the data that you may need. And then you have your data, your databases, where you're actually storing that so you can provide evidence as on demand and as needed. And a lot of those are coming from different logs. So let's talk about that. So this is an example. Change management. I'm assuming those who work with software, they're familiar with change management and the joys that come with it. Now, if you're an auditor, change management is such a pain. It's almost as bad as asset management. But that doesn't exist anywhere, let's be honest. 
So, <laughs> now, change management is something that does exist. You just, it's hard to manage um, in the sense that people do change management crazily. Now, I'm going to reference open source CCF. It's a great thing out there. If you need to use it, it's awesome. But anyways, so in this use example, a user comes to this thing and they say, hey, I this user is going to be an auditor. And I'm going to audit the process where we say, hey, no more do I need to go and ask teams to provide me a population of all the changes they did in the last year or the last six months. That's a very grueling process. Um, and for you to self-service that, if the, if the company or organization doesn't use a really good change management system, oh, good luck. But anyways, so in this case, an auditor goes, hey, I need this team's information this, 90 or this last year and give me the evidence I need for it. Right? That's the example I want. So it sends that to the rules engine through user I. That rules engine is going to say, okay, open source CCF, give me all the requirements for that change. So the one I'm thinking specifically in my mind right now is approvals, making sure that all changes are approved. Now, if you're an SRE or someone who's trying to do things, approvals to get things out and about is a pain because you're like, hey, this is a bug, this is a vulnerability, I need to just get it out, I don't necessarily need approval. We understand that. But from an audit perspective, you're like, every single thing better have that approval, otherwise it wasn't approved. So, so anyways, that's the control we're going to test. So you're, I'm going to go to that C open source CCF, say, hey, I need the controls or requirements about changes for this, right? And that thing's going to return back saying, hey, you're going to need who the approvers are for that team. You're going to need to know the date timestamps of all those things to make sure that timestamps were, like, actions were done in the correct order. You're going to need a rollback plan. You're going to need the name of the change. You're going to need like, what systems are going to be like, affected. All these requirements. Sends it back to the rules engine. Rules engine goes back and says, hey, I have this team name. Now give me the manager. Give me the um, metadata around that team. So it's good to have information about the team. So that's another one. So it sends that back saying, hey, here's the manager of team alpha, whatever you want to call it. Now we go to Active Directory and say, OK, Active Directory, or whatever user directory you have, give me all the people as part of that team. Now Warren makes the assumption that they've approved everybody on that team to be approvers. But anyways, um, give me everyone who reports to that manager who's the team lead for that thing we're trying to get the data for. And we're just block all the users. Now you're going to go through a change management system and say, OK, now give me all the users, or all the changes submitted by all these users. <laughs> for this, this time period and for all these events. Now, you could have done that manually. Good luck. It's a lot of work. You could have done that manually. But now, you just submitted one thing, and now the system is going to start collecting all that for you. right? It goes through the change management system, pulls all the required fields that you've already identified, that you've identified in your CCF control, that you've said, this is the control. So it's even better. You don't have to even identify the requirements. It does it for you. Anyways, you collect all those, and it sends back to you. Now, the rules engine is not just going to dump that data. It should then start analyzing that data. What fields are missing? Red flag. When was the change approved? Was it approved before the change happened? Or was it approved after the change happened? Was the approver on the approved list? Check. Or flag. Right? Was the change? Did it have the appropriate backout plans? Right? If it's a emergency risk, like maybe it's a security risk, and you have a way to flag those, then maybe the backout plan is no. You got to get this solved because there's a security vulnerability. Maybe you have a regulation that says, oh, if it's a low priority change, like a management change, but there's a problem, there's appropriate backout plan. So you're able to validate that configuration. Then it dumps it out. From there. That could have taken, depending on how fast your systems are and how nice you have, it could take anywhere from five minutes to maybe an hour. But you've now automated that whole process, right? No more having somebody go through providing all that detail for you, and you have to go check every single thing. You now have an Excel sheet because it's an auditor. They want the Excel sheet. You have an Excel sheet that has checks and flags. And you can just now start going through and saying, OK, how good is this? How clean is this? You might even do that before an external audit and say, hey, team, go fix these things real quick. And now we're good. All is well. So that's an example of change management. Um, now I'm just going through other examples. Do I have time? No? Uh, a little bit of time? Sweet. So I'm going to slide back to that original side of what tools. OK, here we go. 
On this one, I want to just throw out some different examples that might come around. So when I first joined Adobe, oh man, those are some fun days. We w I was in charge of around 120 teams to do audits. And I had to go and write emails for every internal audit and every external audit to every team, say, hey, here's all the evidence I need from you for everything. And we were, we were auditing for ISO, SOC 2, and a few other, HIPAA, I think, was in there. But anyways, we were auditing for those things and tons of evidence. And then I had to set up a two to six hour meeting with them where I sit down and record them going through every single one to prove that they did it. And then they would have to send me the evidence via email if they weren't able to show me. And then I'd go through the recording for six hours. Hopefully I took timestamps. If not, I was screwed. But to go through and take screenshots of every point in that thing, and that was the most miserable thing. And I said, okay, now I got to do that for email twice a year, and I have to manage those emails, and it was miserable. I was a right out of college, and let's just say email was not my forte. Um, so Kenny Scott, Paramify, he was my boss at the time at Adobe, and I was like, hey, Kenny, I can't do this. I'm done. <laughs> and he's like, no, no, audit's almost over. Take some time after the audit. You have one month before the external audit starts. During that one month, find a way. So at that point, I was like, okay, I know they're using a ticketing system. I'm going to integrate with that ticketing system. N I'm, not, I'm not doing emails anymore. That's the number one thing that's going away. So database, I didn't have a database. I made a wiki, and a massive wiki. It would freeze for five seconds. Every time you loaded it, it was the worst. But I had a wiki of all the teams and all their metadata. And then I had another team of all their systems. And so I had two databases of all the controls, all the systems. And then I just automatically generate JIRA tickets around 4,000 tickets every quarter. <laughs> and funny thing is, the security leadership was not happy about that. <laughs> They're like, why are there so many tickets coming out of security all of a sudden? Like, what happened? And then I was like, sorry, but this is how I'm managing evidence collection now. Engineers love tasks in a ticketed system that they can track it, not through an email that they can't prove evidence of action. And security was like, ah. And then the product teams were like, we love this. Send us more tickets. And security engineering was like, no more tickets. <laughs> so we built more. So now we're generating like 8,000 tickets. And then that became too much. Security engin uh, product teams were like, OK, too many. We love that it's actioned. But this one script isn't going to be enough. And that's where at Adobe, we started doing CCF automation. We said, OK. We've automated this process of tasking this thing out. Now let's automate these tasks. So as we automate those tasks, we drop those tickets. Dropped it down to like roughly from 60 tasks per team down to like 15, right? And now it's a lot more work because each task is this environment. And sometimes uh, buying a third-party tool is the right way to go. Sometimes automating that through another platform is the way we went, right? But anywhere at your stage that you're going through, it be compliance, maybe it's not, maybe it's engineering work that you have. Looking at those ways that you can automate things can decrease it. Now I'm gonna throw in last plug in on AI since I have one minute. Um, one of the things that we're doing that might be interesting for folks is sometimes you can't get away from screenshots of evidence. Sometimes you just, they have to happen and you're just like, I hate it, but sorry, it's not worth my energy and time to automate that. One thing that we're thinking about don't quote me. It's all recording, so I guess you can quote me, darn. But is to think about these things, okay, can we analyze an image? Can we say that image, and then immediately after someone submits evidence in an image format, can we notify them saying, hey, by the way, I'm not seeing this, 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 timestamp, server names, user instances, right? I'm not seeing these key attributes. Please re-upload, right, F with all these things. Now you don't have a two-week gap of like, hey, I upload evidence two weeks later. Oh, sorry, your evidence wasn't wrong. Upload it again. And this cycle of like, oh, but I did. No, I did. Like, but you're missing these things. Like, you can automate a lot of these things by validating items, right? You may even go through and say, hey, data awareness is key when it comes to compliance and what you're having. 
Maybe you're ma automating and connecting an AI to be able to answer questions of like, hey, what kind of evidence do I need to provide for this? And they don't have to go and bother an auditor who has no idea what he's talking about and then who asks another auditor who's like, oh yeah, let me tell you which, who, which auditor you need to reach out to to answer that one question about that one framework, about that one thing. And AI can answer that within seconds. Chatbots are legit nowadays, right? So those are some things I had. And thanks for your time. I appreciate it.